The aim of my, uh, my presentation today is just to basically uh, present some really satellite view of the microbiome. So we basically have an understanding and the same wording, the common language that we're going to speak. And also I'll present to you a little bit uh, what's coming up. Uh, what are the teachers, the TAs that are doing uh, the courses. Just to remind you some of the very important people uh, you know, that help us a great deal. Waters for all the alcohol, bio, K plus, this lunch time to redo all your microbiome while you're here. And uh, the big uh, people who funded us as well in the process. So um, when we talk about microbiome, it could be also metagenome if it's in the environment, but here I'm, we will talk mostly about humans. Um, as humans, we have uh, 10 trillion cells and 23,000 uh, 23, genes. Uh, the microbiome and uh, the microorganisms or the microbiome that uh, kind of our, uh, our friends in here, uh, 100 trillion cells and, and 3 million genes. So essentially, for every human cell, for every human cell, uh, you have 10 bacteria. You're more bacteria or microorganisms than human. And this is basically a, a superorganism that so you interact with it. Okay, essentially the microbiome is, is another organ. So what does it do? It, it's very influenced by the environment and also there's some host genetics to it, so we'll show that to you as well. Uh, some of the microbiomes basically digest uh, the microbes that digest the food that you're, you're having, essentially. Uh, like the polyphenols, that's not you doing this uh, process, and it's a, it's a bug. But sometimes things go awry, and you may have toxins, like since you still and others. Uh, it's important, basically, for two things. It defends you against bad bugs, and it helps you uh, feed yourself, get the nutrients. And basically, the equilibrium between this really controls some of the health and disease states. And it does a lot of function. It, ha it supplies uh, nutrients and energy, and if you have too much uh, uh, nutrients, obesity and metabolomic syndrome, so there's a lot of uh, microbial products that work uh, in controlling this balance. It also prevents cancer, uh, protection and all of these, and toxin and carcinogen, and if you have chronic inflammation, it can favor uh, uh, the promotion of cancer. It also inhibits pathogens, so it's there to defend you, essentially. And some are good, good bugs, and some are a little worse. For instance, uh, C. difficile and uh, Arteriococcus cloacae and, and the likes. And it's also a source of uh, a source of pathogens, so you have to be careful. It's also a source of uh, antimicrobial resistance. So this, because there's a lot of exchange between these microorganisms in this environment. It's also uh, involved in your normal gastrointestinal and immune function. And if you, if you have too much inflammation, if you eat uh, uh, bad stuff that doesn't sit well with you, you can generate some inflammatory processes, and you have uh, inflammatory bowel diseases. It's involved in the motility, so again, IBS, constipation, diarrhea, bloating, and the likes. And it's uh, also involved in cardiovascular health, in controlling the amounts of lipids that you have in your blood and stuff. So, Essentially, uh, it is very well involved in uh, cardio uh, metabolomic diseases. When we talk about uh, uh, the microbiome, it's not just the gut microbiome. We have microbiomes everywhere. So hair, nostrils, skin, colon, and they all, like, it's, it's just one human here, and all of them uh, have different compositions in, in bacteria. There's even somebody who did the microbiome of bugs that you find on your windshield in the summertime. So essentially, uh, we are covered with microbiome, and all of these are, are fairly different. Something you should remember as well is that the microbiome, it changes with age. So when you're a baby, you have a certain microbiome. If you're uh, fed by a formula, so that's the environmental component, or if you're fed a breastfed, it's very different. Well, somewhat different. As soon as you take uh, solid food, there you go. You've got you, your microbiome changes. As a as a infant or a toddler, basically, if you take an antibiotic treatment, it'll change. If you're mal malnutrition, you won't have the same ones. And then if you're healthy, it goes to a certain progression. As an adult, 
if you're healthy or, or obese, you have a different microbiome. And as you get older, your microbiome also changes. It evolves with you in time, okay? And also, one thing, and you'll see that we have a small presentation from somebody from CIHR, but your microbiome, if you're a woman or a man, is very, very different, okay? So essentially, at, at puberty, you can start having differences between a, a male microbiome and a female microbiome. This is hormonal, uh, but it's also due to uh, food intake in some ways. I mean, I will never eat tofu, all right? Never. But <clears throat> some people uh, do it. <laughs> so we fought our way at the top of the food chain is not to eat tofu, okay? <laughs> and, and then, uh, and there's, and this is uh, shown here in a little bit more uh, detail also, that if you're a, the BMI here is uh, how, how fat you are basically, body weight index, uh, it changes as well, and it's different for men and women, and I think that's not surprising. <clears throat> so in some ways, I, when I started doing this uh, work, I write grants, and then I didn't think, you know, I should have the same amount of women and men in my studies. I think this is essential now to, to control for diet, age, and also um, uh, food intake, and sex. <clears throat> so we sequence a lot right now. There's a, a, a cute little paper, you can read it, that uh, showed us there's a, a lot of, uh, we're starting to discover, we sequence and sequence a lot more. So there's aquatic microbiomes, animals, soil, and sediment, or uh, waste, plants, and others. And you have all these, uh, these bacteria. So uh, recently they sequenced, they put into NCBI a great deal more of uh, sequences. And one, what's very interesting is the this is a power of discovery in some ways. Uh, these these new uh, genomes, I think there's a, a little over a thousand, they have biosynthetic gene clusters, so different metabolos, uh, metabolomic processes. And each, basically, each of these bacteria, around uh, two, uh, two, uh, two, two million base pairs, a lot of them have uh, these biosynthetic gene clusters and essentially, some of them have a lot of them, even if they're not that big. These are uh, a series of uh, uh, DNA segments and basic clusters that codes for enzymes that process uh, different molecules. So there's a great deal of new uh, chemistry and biology in these. And it's also something that's very interesting in terms of uh, bioprospection. And I say that because right now there's a lot of efforts uh, are being done to um, essentially look to generate some of these databases. And I think you should, uh, I just put a few there. Uh, there's some obviously on the, on the Human Microbiome Project, lots of data there that if you want to download. Sometimes you say, I'm going to do an experiment, but let's, why not go check if somebody else did something, or they could be your controls for your study. Or you, if you want to, you may test your own hypothesis by using somebody else's data. So you're not being a parasite when you do that, even if the guy from the New England Journal said that, it's just an idiot. But um, in essence, there's also, if you're working in an environment, it's the same. You have a lot of tools everywhere. We're going to go over some of the tools in this uh, class. And so that's very interesting to know. And there's also um, this new one that just came out. There's a lot of uh, microbiome data here, and it's a little bit more cleaned up than some of the databases that you can find out there. So what happens to, to the microbiome? So uh, it changes a lot. Supposedly in this room, maybe 40% of our microbiomes are in common, and the rest is very specific to you. So that's one thing you'll have to remember. Uh, you are the best control for yourself. So my microbiome looks a lot like mine during time. So doing these types of studies, uh, with the repeated sampling of the same microbiome, that's a little bit better. And there's a lot of uh, interesting things that happen in some ways. We did a lot of studies with uh, treating healthy, healthy people with antibiotics, and you, you see a real shift in, in, uh, in essentially in the, the bugs that are there. You select, some, uh, you select some, you make some disappear. It, it's all about basically the, the level of sequencing as well. I remember that 
when we sequence, if you did 10 times, as a, the DNA will be sequenced 10 times. If you did one time, the DNA will be sequenced one time. So if you change this, uh, you have to go really, really deep to, to find species that are not there at uh, very frequent ways. But it can change really rapidly. <coughs> Obviously, antibiotics is a, is a big kick in some ways, especially depending on the antibody. But let's say if you take uh, if somebody's anemic and takes iron pills, it's going to change a lot because bugs love iron. And it's very dynamic. It changes quite quickly. But it has a tendency uh, to come back to some sort of homeostasis uh, uh, ground for yourself. I mean, because you're in a, an environment, you have your own genetics, you have your own food habits, it has a tendency to go back to normal. But when we did this <coughs> particular experiment, and we'll, we'll go over this in detail a little later when we do a more scientific presentation, uh, we actually gave antibiotics to healthy people because we, we wanted to see uh, the, the just antibiotics. So we selected them for all sorts of uh, processes in a sense that they, they didn't work in a lab or a farm. Uh, they were normal people, so no, none of them were scientists. And then essentially we tried to basically uh, control for a lot of uh, variable. And then we gave them an antibiotic. And this is what happened basically. This is a, a PCA, principal component analysis. And this, at the, at the back here, this is the blue, uh, the, the little gray here. This is where they all saw them, all right? Then we give them an antibiotics for seven days. And at seven days, this is where they are, okay? Basically, they, they all change. It's very distinguished. And then we came back 90 days later and asked them, that's kind of the paradigm. After 90 days, your microbiome is back to where it was. It's mostly there. This is a pale blue, but it's a lot bigger. And then some of these people, for instance, this person never came back. She, she's one who, uh, in the course of the study, became anemic, and we gave her iron. And there's, there went, this is where she ended. Okay? So it's very dynamic. It can go really quickly. So in, in terms of doing uh, microbiome work, it's a little bit difficult. So you have to think about these concepts. One other concept that uh, they, they always say that, you know, brown bread is better than white bread. You know, is that true? You have to think about it. It's, it's, it's actually, it's true, it, depending on your microbiome. Some people, the white bread will be better and the brown bread won't be. Yeah. So it, you have to think a little bit outside of the box in some ways, because uh, this is happening uh, right now. Just a little, just a little uh, you know, food for thought here. It's, there's some really wonderful things that are happening uh, in terms of uh, the microbiome. We have this process where we can transfer a healthy microbiome to people who have sensitive infection. So these are uh, usually affect elderly people, uh, average age of 80, that get sensitive and then they basically uh, can, can die from it. And it's a lot of people. It's 40,000 people in the US uh, a year. But we have a cure rate of nearly 90% with this uh, repopulation, basically uh, reintroducing a healthy microbiome into these people. I mean, tell me of a drug that works that well. You know, it's, it's very, very interesting. There's a bit of a yuck factor, but in a sense, uh, this has been worked out right now, and, we, and it's being done in, in, our, in our own hospital. So you have to just validate the, the, the pill that you're going to give to these people, and so you don't give some uh, bad stuff in that. There was a very interesting paper. It was in a bioarchive, but uh, it's not published yet, but, but it, it, it took a killifish. It's a teeny vertebrate fish, and they took the, the microbiome of these younger fish, and they gave them to older fish, and they live longer. So they also, something that's really interesting in terms of what's happening with the microbiome and uh, what we need to learn about it. There are even now companies that uh, you can send your little poop to them, and basically they, they will, uh, not sure about the quality of the service, but they will tell you, maybe you should eat this, maybe you should eat that, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. I'll see how long they survive. Um, there are some ideas here about the, the power uh, to drive coevolution. So in some ways, the microbiome works with us. Our diets change. So they, the, the, the bugs co-evolve with us as a, as a human species. That's very interesting. We'll have a section also on the responses to drugs. 
there are some drugs uh, and some bugs that don't go well together. For instance, if, you, if cardiac patients that have um, uh, heart trouble and they give them digoxin, there's a bug called Ergothella lenta. If you have that, it will not work very well. You have big side effects, and that's you. so. We have the bugs have uh, a lot of effects uh, in processing some of the drugs. So, and also some of the drugs will also control the type of uh, microbiome you have. So it's a two-way uh, communication. And as I said, and this is what interests me the most in some ways, I think it's a very new source of interesting metabolites in those biosynthetic gene clusters. There's a plenty of opportunity to do big data in there, and do machine learning and stuff, and we'll talk to you about that uh, as, we, as we go along. So uh, I didn't want to take, uh, I want to do this pretty quickly so we, we don't get too late. I just want to tell you what's coming. So after me, you'll have a how, metagenomic, how to approach it. So we'll talk about the tools of the trade, CHIME, 16S profiling, how we do the reprocessing. And this is, uh, will be done by, by Robert. Now he has a beard, so he didn't want to be recognized, I guess. But uh, in some ways, uh, some of the tools of the trade will be uh, shown to you. And some of these tools are always, in some ways, some sequencing, we do a lot of sequencing. I'm just showing you what the way we, we do it, but there's other methods with, um, to sequence DNA that's quite efficient as well. In essence, it all starts with the reads of the, of we, we get from uh, the sequences and, and the unit called the KMER. KMER is 21, 31, 41. In bacteria, so usually that range is good, but you can go uh, bigger. And what we do is we assemble these reads uh, in with the room graphs, okay, and then do the assemblies. And uh, remarkably, if you if you're there, about one percent will be able to assemble eighty percent of your genome. Okay, so it's pretty good. Uh, and then what you can do, these are just a normal assembly. You can take a reference database, let's say other species, and basically camerize it. So each one, you can see that there would be thousands or hundreds of thousands here, and you can. Uh, each one is assigned a different color, and then you color all the chemos, and then you go back in the graph, and you get a colored debris graph. And then this colored debris graph, you can see and identify all of these assemblies, which species it is, uh, very, very uh, readily. Obviously, if you give a different uh, reference database, if you give all the ones that are, uh, let's say, uh, resistance genes, kinase, or phosphatase, you can do this, the same process, and you can get the, how much in this microbiome are, you know, phosphatase present, or uh, um, plasmids, or uh, genes of resistance. So these are a very, very powerful tool to start asking, not questions of who, who's there, but also a little bit, uh, what are they doing a little bit? But it's not metatranscriptomic, but that's John will tell you that, but it's a very good indication of what's going on. A little later, the metagenomics is how to approach it. And I say carefully because there's been a lot of problems uh, in some of the metagenomics studies up to now. We'll talk a little bit about the big, uh, bigger picture, and that's the uh, Morgan with Metafalan and showing human and Stamp, and, and Frédéric, uh, who's in my lab and loves scales for some reason. Uh, 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 we'll talk to you a little bit more about uh, Ray Meta and, and Pacros. I think, uh, I think the two of them uh, shared the the process of explaining all of these common tools of the trade uh, so you'll be able to analyze the microbiome more readily. Uh, one interesting uh, process is to look at uh, the biomarkers. How can we use it to predict or, or do interesting stuff? Uh, Fiona Brinkman is going to come and tell you about this. There's supposedly uh, two big enterotypes in, uh, in, um, for, uh, for humans that got microbiomes. So there's the uh, bacteria assay and, and Prevotella. And, um, and these papers are being revisited in some ways. At one point in time, it was even three, if I remember well. So I, I think most of, you, most of us now realize it's some sort of continuum. Uh, but they can be useful uh, trade-offs uh, to, to, to see how it happens. And we'll, we'll talk to you about this as we go along. We'll talk about metatranscriptomics. So basically, uh, John Parkinson will do functional interrogation of those microbiome, just, just, not just who's there, but what are they doing? I think that would be uh, 
a nice lecture for you. It's like very happy here in Toronto. And, uh, and Maxim will talk to you how to compare microbiome. If you have lots of microbiomes, how can you just visualize uh, how to do this? And that'll be done with uh, Ray uh, Surveyor. We'll talk also about uh, host drugs uh, and micro, uh, the microbiome interaction. So there we have some host genetics that influences uh, the microbiome that you get. There's some obvious host genetics. If you have uh, cystic fibrosis, it will definitely influence your microbiome, but there might be even more subtle ones. And there's a paper recently, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get it out to, to, the, to the TAs, uh, that show that the environment now is more important than the host uh, to control your microbiome. So we'll see. I think it's always uh, a given type. Also, a lot of the drugs you take can influence your microbiome. And it's okay. Most of you guys don't take drugs, but you know, when, well, hopefully. And then some of you, basically, later on, uh, uh, presently, an uh, elderly person takes between 8 and 10 drugs a day. So we don't know, and we know about hepatitis, hepatic toxicity, renal toxicity, and neuronal toxicity, but I think there's also some effects now that the, the drug companies are looking <coughs> for uh, microbiome toxicity for some of those drugs. And also, one of the problems is that the drugs have the, can be processed by the, your microbiome or influence the microbiome, and the, the microbiome can actually, this is what happens for digoxin, can metabolize the drugs differently and create some problems uh, for you. And, and, uh, and it's right here, so uh, it's kind of nice. Vincenzo is here. It's, we have uh, this, uh, this is kind of a new era in, in saying that there may be a lot of different con control of the microbiome by the uh, endocannabinoid systems. And I think this, uh, our, uh, our guest speaker is a Canada Excellence Research Chair in, in Microbiome. And uh, he'll talk to us uh, Tuesday or Wednesday? God. Wednesday, that's it. Wednesday, and essentially that will be, um, uh, that's open to everybody the whole Tuesday, Tuesday yeah, okay, Wednesday, the, thank you. so it's Tuesday, so we'll, uh, <coughs> we'll uh, that's open to uh, some of the, to the whole community, which we'll see for that. Okay, so the, I'm in a, in a faculty of medicine, so I, I see this, uh, and especially I'm in infectious disease, so you can see how, uh, I see the world right now is that we have us and our microbiomes, the drugs and the pathogen, and there's a, a cycle now that we just used to do this, and now I think we have to include the microbiome into the, the process because it seems to be a, a very important regulator uh, of our health and also um, essential for, uh, you know, staying healthy. So uh, microorganisms, I, they're our friend mostly. And I think our gut feeling right now is that we should work together. They can help us in some ways. We can recreate uh, states of microbiome that are, are uh, promote health. And, there's a, and also, there's a state of a microbiome that's just uh, terrible and uh, leads you uh, to diseases. So I'll just stop there because I um, just wanted to thank all the, the people from our, our group of machine learners. Uh, that, that, pro, that do some of the analysis, and you'll see a lot of them. Uh, Frédéric and, uh, and Alex uh, here, uh, or, well, uh, and, and Pierre <coughs> and Maxime are here as TAs to, to help you along with some of these questions. I'll stop here because I just want to answer questions and, and see what are your interrogations about uh, <coughs> this field. It's a very new field. There's a lot of... Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of new questions and a lot of room for young scientists to, uh, to emerge and start thinking about uh, this type of research. So, thank you. So, any questions? Questions? Uh, how do you differentiate the effect of the phase versus the microbe when you transfer it uh, to the animals, for instance? Is it the, the microbe or the phage that have an effect either with the first for instance? Uh, it's uh, okay, uh, it's it's not the phage. The phage is actually um, I don't know in terms of uh, in terms if it's a lithic phage or is it any difference for you or all the phage in general. All the phages. In, in the environment, the biggest control of microbes are phages. 
bacteriophages. This is maintains this equilibrium. In in a gut human, it's, I don't think it's any different. So you can uh, stress reactivate phages, and phage can kill certain microbiome, uh, certain microbes that com comprise your microbiome. So I'm not sure if I answered your question yeah. properly, but uh, you can't. Well, we we like phages. We sequence a lot of those too, and that's in the environment. They are the biggest controller of the microbiome. Microbial uh, population. So we quite have another comment. So it's the blood salt metabolism that controls the germination of the bacteria, and it's the restoration of that metabolic pathway, basically. That's also topic. Yeah. And also, it's a niche. You know, when you kill some things, another one moves in, and then you can. That's how it's, it's a little bit like jelly. Which one that goes up? Okay. Yep. I'm wondering if we'll cover at some point things along the lines of data quality, study quality. Like you, you kind of alluded to, there's a lot of crappy data out there, and it's important, especially if you're coming into the field, to be able to evaluate, is this something that is worth following up on, or should this study be completely repeated, or things along those lines. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't like to trush a bunch of colleagues, but... Uh, uh, some, it's, it's, it's not... It's, but, no, but yeah, half... Uh, data cannot be totally trusted. It's good to replicate. That's how we we basically uh, make sure that uh, happens. There's a lot of sequence that's not right, and, and yeah, you should always be very careful about the data use. Especially becomes very problematic in in uh, when we do big data analytics, like we do some mass spec stuff. The spectral libraries are very terrible, so that's a big problem. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Rob. Rob, you had a you wanted to answer that or you had a question? Yeah, yeah, we will. I mean, it's not it's not it's not just uh, this field; it's every field, yeah. And it's not bad intent. Uh, sometimes it's just bad science, and sometimes it's just unaware of. But yeah, you should control I like the sequences. Yeah. But just issues like even if, if I want to do an experiment about like what's the proper study design, what's the proper number well, of what, oh what's this we'll talk about. I mean in microbiome I didn't realize that you know I should be careful to put this uh, same amount of women and men into a microbiome research. You don't eat the same, don't have the same hormones. So this now I'm more aware of it and by reading and by and we have somebody who's going to talk to you about this because it's an important factor in designing studies. A lot of studies are you know. White males. Considering the number of women and men in the study, when we have to recruit children in our study, what about the pubertal staging, the pubertal development? Yeah, I mean, it's all, as you see, the microbiome changes with age. So there's puberty, but there's also uh, for women. Uh, Pre and post menopause, also. So, all of this uh, you have to take into account. Adjust for development? Well, yes. Yeah. So, that means the study numbers have to be bigger. It's just that when you start to do a microbiome research and you want to go to a level of beyond just 16S and you want to do full shotgun sequencing, you need 15 to 20 billion base pairs. Uh, so, every time you, so you can do a certain number and to, uh, and it, it's very costly. I mean, every time you press the button on an Illumina machine, it's twenty-five thousand dollars, <coughs> and you can do maybe maybe twenty, twenty-five uh, microbiome. So you need big numbers, but they're expensive to reach. So that's some of the limitations. But there are tricks uh, to do this properly as well that may be a little bit cheaper. And one of them is go look in the database of some <laughs> if there's something there that's okay as well, just to give you an idea. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. So uh, I was just uh, interested about the gut microbiome. Yeah. So yeah, I'm so glad to see that uh, you know there are a lot of things right now, the data information about it. Yeah. And uh, you showed about the fish. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah. So in humans, is there any like way to transfer the gut microbiome to? Yeah, we, we do it uh, only for medical reasons, and only uh, this is being done for people who have seeds of seal that's resistant to to treatment now, and then they do a, a, tra a, a transplant, a fecal transplant, and then essentially that works pretty well. Yeah. 
It's like just that you if you if you there's some issues at one point in time that I was done that uh, if you don't so they did that some people do it at home they're so desperate and but sometimes if you transfer uh, a microbiome for somebody who was obese to a, a young, uh, somebody who was uh, thin then you may have changed that thin person into an obese person yeah so this you can transfer some bad <coughs> traits as well so that's why people are, are very careful. In, in, in doing this, and it's also you're not doing a, you're not giving a single agent. You're giving a big thing, and that gets the authorities kind of nervous. So there's also <coughs> ethical concerns and, and legal concerns in doing some of that stuff. Is there someone like a doing like a capsule stuff? Yeah, that's a, it's a capsule. Don't worry. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll uh, just uh, what time? Uh, I'll take a few more questions, and I'll, I'm here all week. So you can ask me a lot of questions. But yeah, so it's just a follow-up on that. So what's the what's the when was the first transplant, and how long is the, the follow-up now? It must be I think a couple of years since the first transplant. So you no, know, it's been a while. Uh, I can't talk specifically about. Uh, I can't remember the last time. But we've done at our hospital uh, something like twenty up, up to twenty now, and uh, it, sometimes it works the first time, and sometimes we give another pill. It's, it's not a long treatment, and the person, it, it modulates really quickly, and, and essentially the person, uh, uh, no, 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 the follow-up, yeah. the follow-ups are, are not that long now, but the, the reason, they might not die from this, but the average age of the people who get this uh, uh, are eight, okay. so they, they die from something else sometimes. Okay, um, two more questions. So my issue is this, like, data collaborative uh, uh, at the national level. Because I, I found that like Canadian researcher now we are doing a lot of microbiome study, but our data collaborative approach is really little, and yeah. I don't see very obvious. You know, people are very segregated working, but we never compare our data, to <coughs> and we we store our data very old. And I think that is happening in the U.S. as well. But they are very hard working in, in terms of data collaborative at the national level. But how about our Canadian researcher? Where are we now, and how are we doing? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I was in the U.S. for like 15 years, so uh, people have a realization that you need to pay by the public, so the data is public, and and there are also rules and regulations when you receive grants now to actually deposit the data, and and now CIHR uh, has the same rules, and most of the um, funding agency want you to deposit the, the data. The patients uh, group or uh, foundations, they're like really crazy about you. So it's happening. It's a change in mentality, and it's a great that you think like that. So I'm sure you're gonna deposit your data, and maybe your colleagues will too. Okay, last question. Yeah. As a follow up to one of the questions um, on the data quality, so I was wondering whether bootstrap because the data is what we have, and we can, and that's going to be limited by the ability of the machine. So it introduces biases and other steps beforehand. So whether bootstrapping would be a good approach to use on field analysis yeah, uh, to get robust yeah. results. Okay, bootstrapping always scares people who work in machine learning. Uh, <laughs> if you do too much, we have techniques to, to know if you're overfitting of the data. Uh, I think we'll talk about that. It's, it's a complex issue. Um, but um, yeah, it's a consideration. I mean, I can't, uh, if the data is not really good, it, it doesn't work and you can't salvage it. Uh, if you're lucky enough, well, we try to do a lot of high throughput data, so we can generate lots of data on our own fast, cheaply, and then we have enough to have the statistical power. But if you don't, it's just uh, inferences that you can get. That's it. But we'll have a section in, in, the, in, the, in, in the machine learning to see that. And also, we can also compare we have comparisons of microbiome with others, like uh, at large scale, and then you can see if there's some outliers out there and kind of uh, tease them out. And that's another possibility. All right, we'll stop here. Mm -hmm.